Next up, um, we have Romy. Romy, 1984, cramped in a bivouac. Uh, middle of the night, a skinny scout from Croydon. <laughs> Says a lot. Okay, uh, Romy is a recovery, recovering secondary school teacher uh, that walks the tightrope of bipo bipolar disorder. They are her words, not mine. As you might have guessed, I don't lecture in creative uh, writing like Romy does herself. Uh, Romy, give it up. Thank you for your time. It's very kind of you to give it to me. I've got nothing rude or funny to say. I am, however, wearing pretty shoes. Um, <laughs> Steve is wearing flip-flops and Ed is wearing winkle pickers. I've not seen those around for a while. <laughs> and click. Telling your own story, taking ownership of your own narrative is particularly important to people with a chronic health condition. Doctors write notes and letters about us and I asked a psychiatrist, can I read that letter that the other psychiatrist has sent you about me? And she said, why do you want to see that, do you think? What's my story? It's about me. I want to make sense of it. Our families tell people how we are and what we're up to. If you're really unlucky, there'll be a Christmas letter writer in your family <laughs> who summarises your year in terms of hospital admissions and sends it to everyone in their address book. <laughs> Stories take root and grow really quickly surrounding illness and wellness. He wears his heart on his sleeve. He bottles things up. Some of these things are true some of the time, but people with mental health difficulties are masters of disguise. I am a pessimist disguised as an optimist and an introvert disguised as an extrovert. With all the platforms available, telling your own story has become a common activity. But I wonder if we are hiding secrecy and embarrassment behind a wall of rather generic, bland openness. Facebook and Twitter are full of declarations of support and anti-stigma for people with horrible conditions like anorexia and depression. But I wonder sometimes if we're in danger of retweeting ourselves in a spiral of defiant, rebellious platitudes. And what might actually begin to break down that wall of embarrassment would be up close specifics, would be detail. That because of the prejudice that remains inside ourselves, we're still quite embarrassed and ashamed about some of that detail. The broad brush strokes are quite easy. You can say alcohol problem, violence, hearing voices. But it's something else altogether to describe throwing up on your neighbor's geraniums, trying to stick scissors up someone's nose, hearing a voice telling you to lick your own poo. These are examples and none of them have happened to me. <laughs> These labels have become common currency, but the details are still pretty shocking, and that's where the stigma is. For me, the stigma, the inhibition, really is to do with protecting my loved ones from the up-close details. But like many writers, I am brave enough or foolish enough to write in my fiction some of that up-close details. If you want to know my story, you have to read my novels, not my blogs, because when I package my story as my own, I hide behind the generic. It's the bizarre stuff that goes on in our minds and in our behavior, the stuff that you think is only you. Once we start to share that, we might begin to break down that wall of embarrassment. I was trying to um, achieve shared decision-making with a psychiatrist, um, and I was failing a bit. I was in hospital in my uh, psychiatric patient costume, which is quite scruffy jeans or, or tracksuit, this sort of thing. You have to have greasy hair, this, this kind of stuff. <laughs> and this psychiatrist, obviously, is in a pinstriped suit, and he's failing to engage. So I had um, weekend leave, and I came back in a business suit with a clipboard. And the nurse said, you're looking smart. And I said, I'm making a point about quality of life expectations for psychiatric patients. And she looked at the carpet. So I went into <laughs> the consultation cell and I sat up straight and I tapped my clipboard and I said, who'd like to set the ball rolling? <laughs> now this guy who previously had nodded while I spoke, nodded, and then continued as if I hadn't said anything, finally listened and we engaged and we made decisions together and I think I'd shown him 
that although one of my stories is a rapid cycling bipolar patient with strange behavior and a lot of crying, I also am a teacher and a mother, and I get up in the morning and I look after myself and my children and my students, because after all, he does not go to bed in his pinstriped suit. Or perhaps he does, and that may be a behavior that we need to address <laughs> in our next session. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen.